All right, we are live. Hey, uh, everyone, uh, welcome to this first of many, um, where I'm kind of doing a live stream and having a guest, and we're going to be talking about stuff, tech stuff, usually. And for the first episode of this that I'm going to be doing, I have Mark Nadal. So, uh, Mark, welcome to the show. Is it is that how you pronounce your name? Hey, thanks for having me on. Um, there's there's a debate between two sides of the family. I, I pronounce it <laughs> Nadal, but okay. either way, we're there. We go. Well, um, well, cool. So, do you want to give a quick intro and uh, tell everyone who you are? Yeah. Uh, so, I'm the lead maintainer behind Gun. Is it okay if I start screen sharing? Please. Yeah, so let me pop up. Gun is an open source Firebase, effectively. And we're going to come back to this little index here to talk about what that means. I think it'd be more fun to start with some hardcore demos and to show off uh, what's going on. So um, first thing is a Hello World application, 17 lines of code. You don't need jQuery. You can use React or Vue or whatever you like. But the gun parts of it is right here. You connect to a particular peer. It could be many peers or one peer. Um, we're then going to listen to any change on a text area, and we're going to save that into a key value store inside of gun with a put. And then down here on this line, we subscribe to that data and we put it in. So let me um, spin up one of these self-hosted peers. Again, you don't have to pay me. Um, you can run this all on your own, or you can use the volunteer network for it. So as a demo of what's going on, we have Hello World. Woohoo! Nice. <laughs> all righty. So that's just the, the starting piece. And now I'm going to jump into a couple other uh, demos that are a little bit more um, exciting and useful. And then I'll come back and we'll talk about the different feature sets. So the next one is actually um, a unit test that we run <laughs> before publishing any new version of Gun. And it combines Mocha with a thing we built called Panic that does distributed load testing and correctness. So rather than going through this 184 um, line test, I'm just going to run it for you. So Mocha tests Panic chat. And it's going to basically stream 10,000 chat records between these two um, browsers. And we're going to make sure that um, each we've gotten each one. And let me pull up. Uh, oh, and it already started. <laughs> so <laughs> this is us making sure Gun can behave performantly. And we're done. 2,000 chat, chat records um, wow. synced in about uh, 10 seconds. Um, now this verifies, right, that the performance is working and there's a whole set of conversations here. Like I had to build a custom <laughs> CPU scheduler in JavaScript to actually make this perform well. Uh, and then let's jump into um, user systems and authorization. Here is a multi-user to-do app in about 50 lines of code. Let me just give you a quick um, example of it. I need to actually switch over to uh, here because there's the new version I'm working on that's the high performance stuff. And then <laughs> it's not released yet. Um, and then there's the old version that's a little bit more stable. So I'm going to pull up um, basic user right here. Um, so I'm going to create, let me close that, a user. And these users are actually cryptographically secure. So they're end to end. Uh, they're using like end-to-end -end encryption for stuff. And again, we'll talk about some of these things later. A, B, hmm. C. So it's really easy to add um, multiplayer to your app. So, so where is, uh, I mean, I know we have a lot to talk about. So, but but quickly, like, where is this user being saved? Is that being saved in the in the uh, the peer-to-peer -peer network or is it saved in a database somewhere? Um, all of the above. So it's stored and saved in the browser. In the case of the panic test that we just did, um, the browser actually relayed and the, the data. Um, well, I'll start answering the questions. It's just one last yeah, demo. Yeah, we have a lot. We have a lot to talk about. <laughs> and then I'll let you do a choose your own adventure of which of these pieces you want to explore the most. Let's do a TikTok clone <laughs> and 34 lines of code. Here it is. Um, so let me uh, switch over to that. It's kind of ugly, but whatever. Um, well, 34 lines of code. If you if it wasn't ugly, I you know. I don't know what I would say. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to drag and drop um, 
from over here, uh, a profile photo of me, syncs over there. <laughs> Let's drop in um, a GIF of a video conferencing tool that was built on Gun. Oh, nice. Um, so that's just kind of and then let's drop in some retro wave music. Oh, wow. Uh, so that seems pretty fast. And then, of course, the classic Big Buck Bunny video. So I'll drop that in and let's see. Oh, wow. There we go. Super fast. Yeah, and we're synced. And this is this is on the old version, <laughs> which does not have the performance improvements. Okay. I don't know if you can. All right. I don't know if my audio was playing for the retro wave in the video, but <laughs> those are the, the quick set of, of, of demos. We can explore some of the example code as well as technology and architecture um, behind it. So. There yeah, I mean, yeah. I think this is amazing. I mean, there's so much to talk about uh, as far as the implementation, but also the, the technology behind the implementation and how it's different, I think, than a lot of the stuff that you typically see in this environment. Because a lot of the stuff that you see uh, for building real-time applications are, built, are based on services that you kind of have to pay for, right? And they're also typically, uh, you know, these services are kind of managed services. Some company like AWS or Google Firebase or one of these newer startups is kind of, you know, uh, holding that data somewhere and you're kind of locked in uh, in a way, right? But uh, what is different about uh, Gun and, and just kind of, let's start with like a, a very broad overview because we were gonna dig into the details, but like, how does this work? Yeah. So. The easiest way to summarize it, like I said before, is thinking of it as being open source Firebase for Jamstack apps. Um, I think we've kind of gotten used to porting over our, you know, our blogs and just putting in a Git repo and then like publishing that on Netlify and Versal. And so kind of this utopian dream I'm going for is that, well, what if we could also have dynamic data, uh, tweets, real time GPS coordinates, um, all sorts of information that is also in a Jamstack-like setting. And the best way to do that is by having the browsers themselves be the host for the data and then having some backup peers. So yes, like the data will get backed up to Amazon S3. I'm sure you could plug it into Amplify or any of the backend services as well. But those are more acting as kind of backup um, fallbacks. They're not the the default structure of the system. So kind of the three main features of GUN are highlighted right here. It, multiplayer by default with real-time peer-to-peer state synchronization. Um, the biggest difference from Firebase, other than it being decentralized, um, is that it's a graph database. So you can store key value, um, table, relational data, documents, hypergraphs, files, JSONs, all sorts of stuff in it. Um, while with Firebase, you're kind of stuck with a document store on its own. Um, and a lot of people will just choose to use Postgres instead. And then the last piece is this kind of uh, movement recently around having like local first offline data that is end-to-end -end encrypted. So even if your data is being stored in Amazon S3 or on some backend peer for reliability purposes, it, none of those servers can actually decrypt the data if it's encrypted. Of course, there's plenty of public data, um, but if it's your user data, it's encrypted end-to-end and uh, that that isn't mineable by others. So how does the real-time communication happen between the different connected clients? And how do I know which data to listen for? For instance, um, if we have a chat app that has a million chat rooms, like how do you kind of connect to just the data that you, you want to be subscribed to? Through the API of GUN. So down here on that um, paste example, um, when we say GUN git test, we're saying we want to subscribe to this table or to this node or this document. Um, the cool thing is you can chain a bunch of gits. If you have a deeply nested document, you can then say, well, I actually only want to listen to the, the paste property on the, the test object. And that means even if there's a million other records on the test table, um, or document, you're only going to be subscribed to that um, that one property. And then that message gets synced out over the network. Um, and that is actually what GUN is inside of the stack. Um, so GUN is the kind of the ecosystem name for a bunch of modules that can be used with or without the database itself. Um, 
Ham, to answer your earlier question about um, how do you make sure that the, the data is consistent, Ham is a CRDT, that stands for Conflict-Free Replicated Data Type, and it's kind of uh, a peer-to-peer -peer version of Google Docs algorithms, operation transformation. Um, there was things called Woot at a time. CRDTs have kind of taken over as, as being the better way to approach this, whether you're a centralized service um, or whether you're doing kind of peer-to-peer -peer operations. It's just more robust, more reliable. Um, you can kind of think of Git as a type of CRDT itself. Um, it's not entirely true, but it's a, it's a limited subset of a CRDT. Um, and Git, if you're not using GitHub, is, is decentralized, but still manages data consistency. But Gun itself is the one that's handling kind of the, the protocol for what data is sent where, what you're subscribing to, and what the data looks like itself. And there's a ton of these other pieces dealing with encryption, um, networking, routing, um, storage, and other components. So, um, so if I if I'm using Gun and I kind of uh, create an app and then I'm um, you know fetching some initial data from, um, I guess so. Well, okay. I guess first of all, where would that data come from? If I create, yeah. If I create an app and I distribute it in a bunch of, I have a bunch of users. I have a brand new user and they and they um, kind of sign in or they do whatever they need to do to kind of fetch that initial data. That's going to come from uh, other browsers, correct? Yes. So when you initialize Gun, you can point it to several peers. So one of those, like I was demoing here, is just my local host here, right? Which is usually on 765. But there's a bunch of um, publicly hosted volunteer um, peers. So in this case, like uh, gunjs.herokuapp.com, you can like one-click deploy to Heroku. You can run this on Amazon directly or a digital droplet, or um, there's Docker containers as well. This is is not because Gun um, requires using some sort of server to connect. This is because WebRTC, which lets you do peer-to-peer -peer browser connections, itself um, as a browser feature requires using a signaling server. Um, so we've had to work around that, and that's what these relay pairs do. And they have built-in WebRTC signaling servers inside of them. So when you first connect to the network, you are probably bootstrapping through some public-facing um, relay peer. But regardless of whether you're using WebRTC or not, those relay peers then connect you with other browsers, and those browsers sync back. So if I show you the panic, the designer's panic test here mm -hmm. that we screened the 10,000 records, the topology that's set up is you have Alice, which was the browser on the left, that's only connected to a relay peer called Bob. And you can think of that as, as being some self-hosted um, service you run or um, one of the many that's inside of our community they can just use for free because they're they're volunteer and then that connects to Carl which is another browser so it's not I, I specifically coded this test that Bob the server the relay does not actually store the data oftentimes relay peers will also store and cache Got data it. to improve performance in the network so in this case Alice makes a request for the chat table and there's a cache miss on Bob. And Bob relays that to then Carl. And um, depending upon what modules you have in Gun, uh, most of the default ones, it'll do optimized routing. So it's not going to send that request to browsers that are not subscribed um, to that data set. Um, then Carl winds up having that data in memory or in local storage or in index DB. And Carl will literally then host and serve the data. In this case, um, I'm specifically not testing WebRTC. Um, Carl could reply with directly to Alice over WebRTC, but I'm trying to test the performance of the network as a whole because WebRTC will fail a lot. So that means Carl then um, puts the data on chat and starts streaming it through um, Carl up to Bob the Relay, and then Alice receives that data. And then after it receives all 10,000 records, the test um, confirms and verifies and then closes out. So that kind of gives you an example of one of the many different topologies that the network could form. Um, this is the closest to the traditional server model, but mm -hmm. again, the data has been posted and served from the browsers. Got it. So um, I guess when, when you think about some of the technologies that are starting to become popular, like if you think about the way that, um, I guess, a lot of the newer hosting services like Amplify Console and uh, Vercel and um, like you mentioned, uh, Netlify, 
they have the this idea of like edge computing and then of course edge computing in and of itself is like a, a huge huge thing now is this kind of like the ultimate form of edge computing <laughs> yes there's all sorts of crazy things we can do right um let's assume that well right so if you if you are in california um versus you are sorry what, what, what state are you mississippi in? actually <laughs> okay um you want the data to not be pulling from you know amazon east in virginia it'd be really nice if you could actually pull the data from um, a user nearby now there may not always be a user nearby but we can then combine this with Versal and Netlify. It's actually something um, we're supposed to be working on the next couple of months, but I've been busy with the performance testing, is you can then actually have <laughs> Netlify and Versal take the, the on-disk files. So let me, let me step back to this index. Um, so RAD is a storage engine. You can use RAD without gun, okay? Um, and what RAD does is it uses a Radix tree and it splits that Radix tree across many different files on disk, whether that be in the browser with IndexedDB or um, on a relay peer. We are theoretically able to then take those files that are split across on disk and cache them um, on Netlify or Versal such that even if you have a browser that's never loaded any data before and it's not already cached in gun in local storage, a completely brand new browser um, tab can open up and then pull that file, that chunk from the CDN and then swap it into index DB and local storage in the browser and then hydrate the application straight out of um, the CDN delivered um, shard and then connect to the network. So that way you can get even faster upstart time um, rendered to paint. Even though we've been testing, uh, if I come back to Actually, I, I think I have to rerun the test. Um, even though Gun itself is very, very, very fast to... Can you um, move your uh, your terminal up a little bit? There you go. Yes. Uh, Mocha test panic. Let me rerun this one because it showed um, first paint um, time. So chat. Um, but first, okay. So... The first reply, and again, remember this is being streamed from the browser, was, was and, and this is all localhost. So of course, when you run this on um, uh, a larger network, it's going to be larger. But it, it was um, 86, uh, OK, what is that in milliseconds? Milliseconds. Yeah, so that's, yeah, 86 milliseconds. So that's sub 100 millisecond response for a, a record that, a table that's streaming 10,000 items. Now, that, that's for the first chunk of that 10,000 items. So. I, I just to clarify my comments around using the, the Netlify and Versal and these CDNs for improving performance. It's not that Gun itself is slow for doing um, first responses, but there's still that um, startup time where right, WebSocket right. and WebRTC has to do the handshake. So y we can supercharge this, yes, by combining it with Jamstack um, uh, CDNs, and it doesn't really matter where this data is anywhere in the world. It could be a browser. It could be um, uh, on the CDN or it could be, it could be anywhere. So but how yes, does, like, uh, how does GunJS know who the closest peer is? Um, usually that that's kind of an in works thing. So there's this thing called ax in our system, which is, um, it, it, it does the routing and sharding. So gun by itself is, you can think of it as being a mesh network. It works very, very well. Um, inside of local area networks, Bluetooth. Uh, we don't have any Bluetooth adapters, but you can think of it as like, you could use this for self-driving cars, emitting data like physically over, over radio. Um, but you don't want in these settings that, that structure of mesh data to then um, operate when you're running a service that has users in London, um, San Francisco, Mississippi, uh, New York. Like, you want to optimize the routing for this. So X adds that as the layer without violating any of the peer-to-peer -peer primitives because if the optimized routing doesn't, doesn't work, it then falls back to the mesh network structure. Um, for people who aren't familiar with mesh networks, I want to just explain this a little bit more. Mesh networks are really good for settings like Burning Man or music um, concerts or um, uh, local area networks 
where you have your phone and your laptop and a couple of the laptops all on the same Wi-Fi router. Um, they're also, like I said, really good for doing like physical low latency um, uh, networks. So is it good for communicating wanna... when you don't have an actual like signal and you're not connected to like the internet? Yes, exactly. Very offline settings. Um, much, much more concise <laughs> explanation. However, those um, formats don't scale as well when you're then talking about the internet. Right, you don't right. want to be sending every single message over UDP multicast um, to all other laptops in, in the Wi-Fi router. You don't want to be sending those messages to then millions and billions of other computers. Um, so what Axe does is says, hey, we're detecting that there is a up in up in there's a hierarchy to the the peer to peer network and it's then going to rearrange that network based off the hierarchy and then only route um, packets in gun um, based off of the subscriptions so it's kind of like ip in that sense um, ip addressing where it's only going to send packets to um, you know tier 1 tier 2 tier 3 versus uh, sub networks based off of its routing um, and then the culmination of acts will end in a DHT, a distributed hash table, which will automatically reorganize the network based off of uh, data subscriptions and off of latency. So that piece is not done, um, but even right now, what winds up happening for your original question is that acts, um, when a request goes out, acts will first look if there's any peers within inside of the sub network within inside of this kind of area network or, or this um, relay peer that are subscribed to that data. And then it'll immediately forward um, some requests to a random sampling. It'll like load balance the request to those browsers within inside of the local area network or inside of this server cluster and then directly respond back. And while it's doing that, it's also simultaneously then saying, hey, is there any external peer in the DHT or network um, that will then forward the messages to that will then um, perhaps hit some more persistent long-standing node that has the data uh, more permanently versus uh, peers that just have it cached. So uh, I, I can explain the whole argument for that. I'm trying, I'm trying, to, be, I'm trying to be short. <laughs> um, I'm not trying to, yeah. Uh, there's a lot to explain yeah, yeah, there. I mean, and, it's, and, a, and, it's a super interesting, I mean, it's uh, obviously a very complex system like underneath and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, i've looked at the api though and like even though it sounds complicated it's actually pretty simple to use but like um no it really is but 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 like what what most developers are interested in are like a lot of a lot of developers especially these days are kind of like so bought into uh their framework that they're looking for framework specific implementations um and and, and for instance i don't know like if uh like in your demo, you're basically manipulating the DOM, and I don't, you know, most most developers these days are not writing jQuery and, and HT. I'm, I'm sorry, and um, and document dot create element, all that stuff. So like, if they were to kind of start using it now, like what um, packages would they be using? Also, uh, I know there is like a GraphQL gun. I want to talk about that, but not right yes. the second. I don't know how much you know about that. I know it's like a, a library from the the community, or at least I think it is. <laughs> so there's view gun, there's GraphQL gun, there's React gun, there's React native guns, so there's even some native gun oh, nice. um, mobilizations. There's Svelte gun, there's um, Angular gun might be really, <laughs> really old. Both of these are community contributed, but we're trying to um, make sure they're, they're as uh, up to date as possible. It was a little hard when React and Vue and a lot of these systems are upgrading so fast. So, right, so right. yes, the jQuery there was just a like common um, ground kind of DOM manipulation. Right, right, just and like a basic one, use case. Yeah. Um, so then my, my encouragement is for people to take those really basic um, example apps and then build the React version of it, build the Vue version of it. So Gun works really, really, really well with any UI framework. So. Um, Quickly before jumping into the yeah. UI framework, the last thing I wanted to comment about like the scale of the network is I do know that the routing algorithms work very, very, very well because um, we've been testing against, uh, and th this month is actually pretty small, about 6 million monthly active users. We've seen that as high as 30 million monthly active users. So wow. the system, there, there's some bugs I'm still working through. There's a lot of battle testing I'm needing to do, but um, just because gun is peer-to-peer, -peer, 
doesn't mean that it doesn't scale extraordinarily well. We've seen, you know, up to like 17,000 concurrent users per second. Oh, damn. Um, network. Now, uh, if you are running any system with that production, you're certainly going to have to come to me because um, there's all sorts of bugs and problems I'm still fixing at that scale. But but uh, it's getting there. Hopefully by next year, we'll be um, uh, pushing about 100 million monthly active users. Uh, wow. But I still got to get this uh, this new high performance release out and, and test it against the current network. Well, how does it feel to be like working on something that that many people are using? That has to be a really cool, cool feeling. <laughs> It's extremely gratifying as an open source developer that like, yes, like these tools not only can work, but can scale, but also have um, adoption. The The crazy thing, though, <laughs> is that as an open source developer, you're still always comparing yourself against other packages. Oh, right, right. So right. Like, oh, you know, React and View, even though they do different things, right? But like, I know how many hits Firebase has. I know how many hits... You know, back in the day, Parse had. Um, so it, I, it is, it's extremely gratifying. Um, but th there's always the next stage. I don't want to assume that the technology works. I always want to assume that my code has the bugs in it. Um, and so if you, if you saw in our in our in our um, example apps, if you go to actually, I guess it's still running um, the. If you go to any app, it kind of logs out this message at the very beginning, which is like, look, if you spend more than five minutes trying to figure something out and gun, I want to assume it's my fault that we can make this easier and better. So come to our community and complain. We'll figure out a workaround in the meanwhile. Um, but that that definitely is an example of an area we can polish and improve gun. So I'm, I'm trying to make sure I stay as humble as possible and assume the worst case, because it usually does wind up being my code. <laughs> well, that is the box. Um, so I guess the question I have is someone that hasn't actually built something in production with gun, even though I have kind of played around with it. Um, coming to this right now, someone that's never used it before, if they were to kind of want to build, you know, um, an app that stored some, you know, some information that is kind of like a to do app or something like that, um, and then maybe have some user authentication in front of this app. Um, would you say that they would use Gun for both the user authentication system and to store the data, um, or can you mix and match, or do you recommend doing you know uh, one or the other? And also, can you walk through the steps like from very very scratch? Like I create a new React app using Create React app. What do I do next? Yeah. So to quickly answer your first question, it is highly recommended that you use both the the Gun database and the Gun authorization system because they both kind of um, assume peer-to-peer -peer structures. Um, we have had companies and startups that try and mix like Firebase login with gun, but then you're doing this like this weird matchup where the public keys, the cryptographic verification is being like saved back to Firebase. So this either, um, either the startup wants to um, manage the account of the users, in which case like there's no benefit of having the private key because now the private key is exposed to the server, which by default in gun, it's not. Or um, you're then trying to do this like matchmaking. So it, it's a little bit complicated to integrate it with other um, user auth systems, but it's been done. And if that's important, do it. But you know, we are trying to encourage uh, companies and startups to switch over to a more ethical system of having peer-to-peer -peer user apps where the identity and the login is owned by the user, not by the company. Got it, um, yeah. Then the next question, okay, if you want to get started or run through the ropes, um, I try and have everything go out of the browser, and then for developers who know how to do command line, they can follow up there. So just go to gun.eco, E-C-O, hit get started, and this is gonna take you to our classic to-do app. And this will walk you through the to-do app I showed you earlier. Um, it's mm -hmm. an interactive coding tutorial. In about That's five nice. minutes, you'll learn all the basics of gun. And that's the best way to get started. I do want to note that because we've been shifting from this kind of old version of gun to this new version of gun where I've rewritten it for um, th that performance stuff, I do think that this to-do tutorial is maybe slightly broken towards the end. Um, so please uh, have patience and hold on. But but code-wise, yes, this is as simple as it is um, to get started in about five minutes to build a multi-user to-do app on top of gun. So with 
What, like, uh, so sorry, go ahead. Okay, I was gonna say, so say yeah. say that I wanted to connect uh, my my GunJS app to some database for persistence. Um, like, what what would be the best way to kind of to get started understanding how that all works? Well, Gun does persist your data by default. Um, like I said, okay. in the browser with local storage and IndexedDB, if you include RAD, our storage engine in the browser, or um, any most of the the relay peers that you connect through that bootstrap your connection to other browsers, um, a lot of them will also store data and they will dump that to disk and they will typically back it up to Amazon S3. Okay, so by default, I mean, so you don't even have to worry about that at all. You were saying like, Correct. okay, got it. Okay, that, that makes sense. That's interesting. I do want to be clear. If you want to use Gun purely for its in-memory cache, you don't have to use RAD. You can like disable the storage. And there's plenty of people who, who do that. Um, and there are other people who have then created both gun adapters as well as rad plugin adapters that dump the data to not just S3 or um, index DB or disk. They also dump it into Mongo or Level or um, uh, Postgres. Now, I want to be clear that there's a distinction between um, the interoperability between Postgres versus gun. It's not saying that you're importing your Postgres data. Um, it's just saying that we're using Postgres or MongoDB like a file system. Um, so don't think that that means like there's good interoperability between your existing Mongo database set and Gun database set. Gun is is if you want to get all the cool tricks it offers of the real time synchronization, state resolution, it has some metadata and a structure it has to save the data as. So you but, mentioned yeah. uh, CRDTs, state resolution. Um, I'm guessing that the whole conflict detection and conflict resolution is all already kind of all built in. Um, how does that work yeah. for, as far as complex objects are concerned um, and offline like use cases and things like that? Is, is anything like that taken into consideration? Ah, so I have a wonderful cartoon <laughs> that I've made for you. Um, we won't go over the cartoon in this video, of course. I'll just reference it for people okay. to check out. Gun.info <laughs> slash distributed slash matters .html. It explains the difference between um, the archaic um, uh, bad systems that you know use this terminology of master slave that we just need to destroy. You know, uh, databases that are not egalitarian that still have Paxos and Raft built into them. So it kind of gives an explanation of what those systems look like, and then does a comparison a bit against what CRDT um, based systems are. So the gist, um, if you if you don't want to read through the entire uh, tutorial, there is in the docs here. Um, if you browse through. On the side, you can go to learn architecture oh, cool. CRDT, and it will pop up actually a a sixty second video, a one minute video that just very quickly um, kind of explains how the CRDT works. It's a deterministic CRDT, so every single peer runs it. There's no single um, master or um, uh, source of truth. Got it. So we're destroying that notion and making systems more equitable and more egalitarian. That's awesome. Yeah, I know one of the things that we've been working on and that we've kind of been trying to build out um, some type of solution for is kind of this this answer to the um, offline, real-time, you know, uh, use case where you do have conflict detection, conflict resolution, um, but across multiple different types of clients. And I think that... Um, you know that's always been a, a really tough problem to solve in, in the industry, and I and I feel like um, there's a lot of different approaches to it, but it's not an easy problem to solve. It's just like, you know, there's so many things to take into consideration, and 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 de depending on your approach, there's just going to be a you know typically some type of trade off. You know, it's true. Um, we're not a strongly consistent database. We're not globally consistent. So that means you probably don't want to run monetary or financial transactions through gun um some people have tried to do that and like you you can build gun such that it makes those trade-offs underneath but then you lose the performance right gun is what's called in the cap theorem and highly available um you know offline first uh, partition uh, partition resilient system so m i would argue that those are more interesting because 99 percent of the applications we use on the web are you know streaming cat videos, looking at cat photos, um, a Twitter GPS coordinate, like you don't need a sense of global consensus. Uh, so don't use gun for, you know, uh, financial purposes. Um, or you can experiment with that, but don't complain. <laughs> I've warned you in advance. So 
but that you know banks are not the most popular apps out there <laughs> um, people don't use their banks that often compared to facebook or twitter um the other thing here is because i'm come from more of like a mathematical background honestly the crdt stuff the math the the protocol and synchronization stuff was much much easier for me than implementing that gun api the chaining api that's as you described kind of very simple and elegant because there's all sorts of like nasty weird javascript edge cases mm -hmm. that i had to go through and, and you know even six years later i'm still rewriting it for performance purposes so the hardest thing for me to build in gun was actually an api that's extraordinarily simple and elegant and deceptively hides all of the complexity underneath um, but the complexity there is javascript <laughs> not the actual CRDT or the database management. Um, that, that, the protocol stuff, for the most part, is, is easy. You just sit down, you talk with your friend, and you figure out how humans would build such a system, and then you implement it in code. And then you suffer the misery of the code you implemented and realizing you have to rewrite it five times because it's not performant, or you did a, a for loop in a place you shouldn't have done, or JSON parse is ridiculously slow <laughs> um yeah so I, I'm gonna, well I go i was gonna use that as a kind of moment to step back and look at the rest of the stack yeah, because yeah. um i in order to to switch over to the high performance mode i implemented a custom json parser and stringifier which sounds like the most ludicrous thing to do and i've avoided it for five six years but um unfortunately when people are trying to live stream video through gun um and drop in like these assets it's still a work in progress, so there's still some performance issues. I needed to make sure that um, large objects inside of GUN were not going to get serialized into JSON, <laughs> um, because JSON um, with V8, Chrome's V8, will just stop and then process the data. And that, that could take like 250 milliseconds, a quarter of a second um, to process. And you can't have that when you have a relay peer or a browser that's a video game, right? Like you can't right. just have the video game freeze yeah. for a quarter of a second or the relay peer freeze for a quarter of a second when there's 10,000 other connections. So Wison is a yielding JSON parser that I implemented from scratch in, in JavaScript. And the fascinating thing that I kind of want to encourage a lot of application developers is, hey, if you're just building an app, um, chase that. Like don't, don't get into all this crazy low level performance. Just use the frameworks. Mm -hmm. But if you're, if you're curious about this stuff, you're always going to be able to one-up your career by rebuilding kind of the lowest level pieces of technology from scratch. And you'll find out that um, it's fun. It's like a puzzle. It's a game. And and oftentimes, it's not that hard if you if you sit down and think about it from first principles. Um, if you wind up Googling your answer for everything and you try to mash those all together, is going to be difficult and complex and and weird. But if you just like sit down, have a whiteboard or a piece of paper, and you like think through the logic, it, a lot of these systems aren't that hard to rebuild from scratch. I'm not saying you should rebuild them from scratch, but they're great for educational purposes. And then go back and use the frameworks as long as they're still delivering on the performance um, that you want. So I found out <laughs> that while my custom JSON parser is on average three to five times slower um, in, in than um, V8's JSON parser. It's only slower for small JSON messages. But if you happen to have an extremely large um, value um, inside of there, the JavaScript implementation of the JSON parser is actually 10 to 20 times faster. Wow, wow, than that's V8. great. That's wild. And the reason why I think this is the case is because V8 in the C code or whatever it is, um, for those large records, will still do um, byte by byte iteration. And I don't know why, in my implementation, I use index of to seek to the next quotation mark, which is the JSON um, delimiter. And so I'm pretty sure for the, like these large records that are getting saved, um, my code is just skipping a thousand bytes right, right, or right. Bytes and not doing per byte um, uh, checks on it. So as a result, for large records, it happens to be you know ten to twenty times faster, um, while not slowing down the the UI or the the relay peers because it's the same code that's shared by both. Um, but yes, 
for for smaller messages, it is a little bit slower, but I'd much rather have um, the responsiveness and a non-freezing UI that doesn't lock up. Right, right. That, that makes sense. I mean, that, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I have to say, one thing I really think is pretty cool are these acronyms. They all sound pretty cool, like ham, gun, rad, <laughs> panic, party, yeah, PTSD. I, can, can, I, can I brag here? Because it's fun. <laughs> uh, a lot of them have like recursive acronyms to them. So uh, rad is radix at disk. And then, of course, you could take rad there of uh, radix and then like recursively. Oh, uh, right, um, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, gun stands for graph universe node. Um, okay. The argument here is that you can represent any data structure as a graph. You've probably heard me mention this in other podcasts is that um, a document database in mathematics is just called a tree. Um, and then a table database in mathematics is just called a matrix. Both matrices and trees um, can be represented as graphs. So a graph database, whether it's GUN or Neo4j or the other ones out there, can store any other type of data. But a document database or a table database cannot necessarily store any other um, data uh, unless you do like special formatting because a matrix, um, while it's isomorphic to a graph, it, a, a graph loses information when you convert it back into a table or back into a document. Um, and th there's some talks I've given that show visuals on this. So um, um, w what are the most popular types of apps that you see people building with GUN? Yes, um, there's a ton of people doing video stuff lately. And I want to be okay. clear, like, video was the last thing I imagined gun would would work doing. So we're st I'm still Video is so tech. hot right now. Like, I see I a lot of the work I do at AWS now is, is, is helping customers build uh, live streaming stuff or or uh, just video stuff in general. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, that's why I've been doing this performance stuff, is to up the game and make sure the video streaming and video playback is... Uh, performing better. Uh, still need some time on that. Um, so video has been very popular. And then uh, what Gun was actually originally intended for was like metadata, small pieces of information like uh, tweets or GPS coordinates updating in real time. So here's yeah. just kind of a quick sample of the crazy diversity of the different types of applications built on Gun. So people are doing 3D video games <laughs> inside of Gun. They're doing distributed machine learning and AI models hmm. on Gun. So this is like showing um, a, a food or energy network where two browsers find different um, sources of food and then you synchronize it with gun and then the other browser realizes that the that um, there's a larger uh, score there's a larger um, uh, treasure to be found from the learning um, that happened in this browser then there's like the uber analogy which is the gps coordinate here updating in real time mm -hmm. on my phone that i can track where the car is going and then jump out in front of the car <laughs> <laughs> and get it and then there's um, of course like fraud detection, data visualization, and graph analysis, where you're actually using graph systems for the full power, where you're traversing them and looking at different interactions and finding um, common patterns. This was supposed to be a social network, but it just kind of looks like a, a Christmas <laughs> um, the rock concert, but um, social networks are being built on top of GUN. Um, the most popular one we have right now is Iris, um, and that's a whole library on its own as well and then there's iot systems that are synchronizing um, temperature readings across um, different systems then there's ar vr apps inside of 3d um, worlds and then uh augmented reality this is a cad system where it's synchronizing your cad software um across different devices ipads hmm. um from browser tabs and then finally the most recent one that i started with is um, Mozilla sponsored us to do live video conferencing. <laughs> so yeah, I I'd like to talk about that. Um, so what what part of the video conferencing app is 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 using Gun? Is it the actual? Is it the chunks of of, of video data that's that's kind of uh, being used to stream between the peers that to create the video in real time, or is it like buffering the video, or how does that work? So it's, it's three tiered. Um, the developers originally were trying to use like WebTorrent and direct web or TC connections for streaming the video where they'd have, um, and then uh, that should work, but because WebRTC is a high failure rate, um, they kind of then switched to actually using Gun, which shocked me because they're like, Gun was actually uh, a little bit more reliable than the other systems. I, I, I Don't quote me on that. 
Because I would say that's not possible. Um, but they did actually get streaming audio and video chunks through Gun working reasonably well. Not for live streaming. Um, like it would, it would kind of work, but you would get like the the classic stutter or it would have to catch up on old. It like wouldn't fast forward the latest one. So then they uh, revised that again. Um, where they used gun to coordinate the WebRTC connections and then use gun as like a fallback for some of the data and then streaming. So meat thing that was um, sponsored by Mozilla is using gun for coordination. However, um, in order to scale to larger room sizes, WebRTC just starts to stop working after about six peers, hmm. especially if you're streaming yeah. video, because that means you're streaming video out to each six peers. And those six peers are streaming the video to you. So they combined it with Media Soup, which is what's called an SFU, that they baked in the same way the WebRTC signaling server is baked into um, the gun relay. They also added a Media Soup as an SFU into the relay's um, peer. So that way the browsers could dynamically switch between, you know, if you're just doing a one to one video call, you probably actually want to keep it to the WebRTC video stream mode coordinated by gun. Um, but then if the room gets too big, it would switch to sending the video streams to the SFU relay, which would downsize and decode and do extra sampling on the relay peer, and then broadcast a single stream out to the browsers. However, um, that then starts meaning that the system becomes more centralized or federated, and you can't, there's only so much you can scale that unless you're Zoom. Um, so the next tier that they're still working on adding is combining that second version, which was live streaming the video through Gun itself with this WebRTC. So you can imagine that the combination, you have this tiered structure that if you are doing um, a presentation, if there's a hundred people in a room and there's only two people presenting, well, probably all hundred people will form a direct WebRTC connection to that um, single right. um, uh, presenter and live stream that. Then all of the photo icons of the hundred people in the room will probably be downsampled and saved as thumbnail, like video thumbnails into Gun, and then that will be broadcast out. However, depending upon um, whether you're subscribed to that chunk of the video room, because like on Zoom you can like scroll through, um, Gun right. would only be subscribed to, like these five thumbnails and then if you scroll you know it would it would subscribe to the next right, right, uh, right. chunk and, actually, and and so then you would be live streaming like yes a video through gun but the down sampled size such that it's indexed and cached um versus the larger sample size and then simultaneously mixing with the sfu for different is there an example so, of uh, of an app that's that's open source to show how to do video streaming with the gun or is there any examples on the website so there's the difference between video playback, which I gave you um, over here. Yeah, video playback play seems, I mean, that's just referencing like an MP3 or something there, right? Correct. Right. Yeah. Or an MP4. And then there is video streaming. There's probably three or four, but again, the one that's gone in the most consensus and community developed around it is MeetThing. Um, so you can try out MeetThing by just going to um, meetthing.space and then start up your own room and that will do, um, uh, person to person video conferencing. And then if you want to dive into the code, oh, cool. you can check out the you know, repo. So it's here, open source. Okay, which, cool. Yeah. Can you spin up your own code. version of this in your in your yeah. browser? Oh really? This is Well, um in this case you'd be spinning up the your the the S the the relay WebRTC signaler and um and uh SFU as on like DigitalOcean. Um so that way you still get the performance benefits of that particular combination. Got it. Um, but yeah, you can munch on code here to to look at how that's done. If you want a peer streaming video through Gun example, you're going to have to jump into the community, and we'll reference you to some of the code from about like a year and a half ago that was doing that. Okay, cool, man. Uh, I I think that we covered uh, a lot, and this is actually so. Like, I, I think that um, you know, I meet a lot of people in the uh, in the in the JavaScript ecosystem and the and the programming ecosystem, I think that some of the stuff that you've talked about is is atypical from a lot of the stuff I see in the front end community, and it's, it's really interesting to kind of deep dive into this. And I I feel like we could go on for like ten hours into to each like if we went into each one of these little things that we've kind of gone over, we could we could actually talk for a long time. So I think that this is a really interesting conversation. I think a lot of people are also going to find it interesting. Um, so. 
I guess one thing real quick before we jump off and finish, uh, how can people find you on social media and how can they uh, keep up with what's going on with, with GunJS? And can you kind of show also the uh, React and GraphQL and maybe view uh, quickly where, where that stuff is just to kind of take a quick look yes. at that? So I'm Mark Nadal um, on Twitter. Follow me there. I do a lot of um, updates on gun. Um, Gun.eco is in entry if you want to start with that to-do app I mentioned earlier. Um, you can watch some videos. What's going to be most important, though, is to jump into the community. So that's at chat.gun.eco, and that's our Discord um, server. We're trying to actually switch over to our own chat app and dog food, but mm -hmm. there's a lot of people who've been on Gitter and Discord. Now, that, Discord is a good um, place, yeah. Just, yeah. just for the so community chat, that's already there. Yeah, chat.gun.eco will get you into the community where you can talk and play around. Gun.eco will get you into the to-do app. And then um, from like once you enter into the, the docs here, um, you'll see that over here, maybe we need to improve this a little bit better. Where is the React stuff? Let, let me just, you what? Know um, it is listed somewhere in the readme, but if you go to gun.eco slash docs slash React, Unfortunately, you have to do a capital R because GitHub um, wikis are, are okay. <laughs> case sensitive. Um, this will get you started with um, React as well as then uh, oh, React Native. Um, and then Svelte is where you would expect right there as cool. well. And I can tweet the for you guys. Um, so that's how you can get started with the other UI frameworks that will play nicely with, with Gun. And then, again, my Twitter is Mark Nadal, N-A-D-A-L. Awesome, awesome. So um, thank you for coming on and for talking about all this stuff. It was really cool. Is there anything that you wanted to kind of uh, shout out before we, we wrap this up? It's a huge honor. Thanks for having me um, on the show. And the things I like to shout out is, is, sure, there's all the technology, there's all the algorithms, but the most important thing I've found is creating a community that has shared values around freedom, um, fusion and, and, oh my goodness, I'm blinking on my own value systems. <laughs> uh, I, I talk about this at, at the very beginning of the, the GitHub repo, um, which is like, we, we want to build tools that are not just like free, but they're also fair. Right. So that way, <sighs> like I have a bunch of other podcasts. I'll just link. You guys <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Where, where there's the whole values philosophy behind gun. But I don't, and it's very opinionated, but um, none of the, the tools themselves have those opinion baked into them. And none of the algorithms have that baked into them. You can use all the pieces in the stack independently from all the other pieces in the stack. However, um, for me, the mission that I'm driving towards is trying to create a more equitable, fair, egalitarian, free, and um, interconnected fusion, interconnected um, society and internet. And, and that's the purpose that drives me. So take all the technology with a grain of salt. If you don't apply it for actual meaningful social impact, then um, it, it doesn't, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. It's just a to-do app. Uh, so let's do something a lot more important than that. Love it. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, yeah, so that this is all really, really great stuff. So thanks again for coming on and um, we will uh, be talking again soon, I'm sure. Thanks for having me on. <laughs>